uh, I very very thankful for our panelists to be here because you will hear I will ask them to maybe very quickly tell their stories where they are and I'm sending these hugs everyone who just escaped and I'm so so happy to see your faces safe um, so the war which started in Ukraine has three major conflict dynamics and its roots uh, first is marginal Generalized uh, position of Ukraine as a border state between two political, economic, ideological systems. Both Russia and West have competed to impose their influence over Ukraine, promoting the expansion of NATO or different forms of unity with Russian Federation. However, at the same time, West often portrayed Ukraine as a weak, corrupted state, and Russia uh, presented Orange Revolution and Maidan as Western interventions resulted in pro-NATO leadership of Ukraine. This created dynamics of threats, both realistic, symbolic, and were employed by Russia in justification of current invasion. Second, we see that Putin administration denied the distinct identity of Ukraine, ascribing the pan-Slavic even Russian identity, redefined history of unification of Ukrainian territories as artificial combination of acquired land. And third, international community and the U.S. administration did not create strong response to Russian invasion in Georgia in 2008. Moreover, in 2014, uh, the Winter Olympic were held in Russia a few miles from occupied territories of Abkhazia and Ossetia in January, and shortly after, in February, Russia annexed Crimea, invaded eastern Ukraine in March, and with very weak Western sanction and no serious consequences for Putin vision. These three dynamics impact the form of the war. It's not a war between ethnic or national groups, but a violent invasion in the territory of sovereign neighboring nation. Unable to reach quick victory and replace Ukrainian government due to very, very fierce resistance of Ukrainian population and army, Putin employs civilian devastation as a tactic of intimidation, hoping that suffering of Ukrainian people will influence the government decision to accept Putin's demand. Result is humanitarian catastrophe for Ukrainian people, with cities destroyed and over 2 million people already displaced. More people in impacted cities are unable to escape via humanitarian corridors because of ongoing fighting and shelling or their unwillingness to migrate to Russia as proposed by Putin. Shortage of war, food, medication, as well as say, shelter are, are affecting millions of people. In addition, trauma that is experienced by population will have a long-term effect on the nation. Many governments, businesses, organizations, individuals are stepping in to help the Ukrainian people. And today we hear, I'm happy to have Ukrainian uh, scholars, those who uh, work on Ukraine and Ukrainian on their region to discuss the roots of the conflict, to discuss what can be done to support the brave Ukrainian nation. I will introduce our participants in no particular order. And after that, if I will ask before we go into questions, if some of you can share your, I, I know it's very hard, it just only if you want to share your particular story right now in the war, what, what happened and how you, your own personal experience, and then we will go into, <clears throat> so first, but first I want to introduce participants again, as I told in uh, no particular order. Olga Filippo, which I'm really happy to see, uh, and if she wants, she can share her story, is Associate Professor of Sociology and Vice Dean of International Cooperation in School of Sociology, Horizon Kharkiv National University. Her main topics are geopolitics of identity and border studies, and we work together on, on two very wonderful uh, projects supported by the uh, State Department in Kharkiv and University. And together with her is Alexandra Dinyanka, uh, who also uh, we work together on this project. She is Associate uh, Professor School of Sociology at uh, Horizon Kharkiv National University and Head of Youth Sector of Sociological Association of Ukraine. 
and she soon will become visiting a research in Oslo Metropolitan University for the time of evacuation. Mikhail Minakov is senior advisor of Canon Institute for Drew Wilson International Center for Scholar and editor in chief of Canon Focus Ukraine of the ideology and politics journal and foreign community. And Mikhail is a long, long time friend and colleague who we work together similar as Georgi Kasyanov. Thank you again being here. Also long time friend and colleague, um, dear colleague, professor at the Institute of the History of Ukraine, fellow now at the Leibniz Center for Contemporary History. Victoria Sirida, um, she's a senior researcher in the Department of Social Anthropology, National Academy of Science, and currently research fellow at the Imre Kertes College, Jena, I'm sorry for my pronunciation in German. And she research on nationalism, migration, identity studies, memory studies, and civic society. And unfortunately, Tatiana Kuzelova could not join us today because her train from Poland to Germany was delayed, and she's right now on the train, but she told she will participate in our future um, uh, events. Again, I'm so thankful for you to be able to join us in the situation. Um, and the question is, if some of you want to share quickly, um, sorry for quickly, but share your story of the war. Olga, maybe you. Okay, you... Let, 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 me, uh, let me start. Um, uh, <coughs> I, I try to, to talk about our experience. Uh, shortly, uh, we since first since the first day of the war, uh, we spent seven days and seven nights in a bomb shelter, and uh, I would say that for us it was we were lucky in this sense because it was really a bomb shelter. We didn't hear real explosion. And my son is lucky as well because he didn't hear in full degree this uh, uh, explosion because this shelter was organized by young guys, IT specialists who are also lovers of rock music. And this summer they uh, created bar for rock music. And this bar became bomb shelter and they have very good uh, isolation for uh, any sounds that is why we uh, heard these sounds of bombing like uh, raining storm and in this sense we are lucky really lucky because a lot of people in Kharkiv especially in Kharkiv they have very deep psychological trauma of of this bombing which is uh, going on two weeks going on non-stop days and nights uh, and these guys they become uh, volunteers and they organized very good volunteering nets and cnn show some uh, video a reportage about these guys and you can find this information about them. We spent seven days and seven nights in this bomb shelter and my colleagues and friends and this is a sign of our academic networks. Now my story is story about academic networks. Uh, since 2010 I had several projects with colleagues from uh, University of Eastern Finland in Joensu and one of my colleagues when she knew that we spent the uh, time in bomb shelter with my son and my dog she organized group of supporting for our escaping from Kharkiv and through big uh, volunteering net they just informed us what we should do where we should call uh, to go out uh, from Kharkiv to leave Kharkiv. And thanks to these people from Joensu, from Finland, we knew 
what we should do in Kharkiv, to whom we have to call just to go out from Kharkiv. And after seven days in a bomb shelter, we left to Poltava and it was a very interesting experience. Again, we were lucky because it was a time of silence and we didn't hear this bombing attack during our escaping from Kharkiv. And volunteers, they uh, brought us like uh, 30, 40 kilometers from Kharkiv. And uh, volunteers from Poltava, they came with uh, medic medicine and uh, food for Kharkiv and then just exchange us to another um, car and okay. this um, uh, aid to Kharkiv. And then we went to, to Poltava, spent one day and after one not day one night in in Poltava again I received information about how to go from Poltava to Lviv by bus and we spent 29 hours by bus to reach Lviv it was not free for free it was like 100 euros per person to go to Lviv again we received uh, information about where we can stay for one night and after that we crossed the border to Poland and uh, Finnish colleagues they met Polish Polish uh, friends they met us in Poland and uh, then uh, Finnish colleague uh, sent uh, other persons who uh, brought us to Finland through Lithuania Latvia and Estonia so this trip from Kharkiv to Yonsu, we spent seven days and we arrived just yesterday. It was also difficult because we had dog, which is not allowed uh, for train or for uh, a plane. And uh, I also would like to say that many, many, many universities in Europe and many research centers that propose help to Ukrainian scholars, they offer different programs and a uh, very interesting moment that uh, men they don't have uh, they cannot go because we have mobilization for men and also very interesting point that uh, ladies who can go female researcher who can go uh, in the frame of such programs. They refuse to go because they don't want to leave their husbands. And I know many families in such situation. So shortly, it's our story. And uh, again, uh, colleagues from uh, University of UN, so they will propose for me some research program, research assistance here. I don't know for how long it will be known tomorrow will, when I will meet them because today I have first day of rest and first night to sleep normal. In peace. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but Olga told me if I can share Olga that uh, Olga told me she could not sleep because she feels yeah. guilt for all these people left behind and she's still in it it's boom shelter but it's not boom shelter it was unfinished basement and the picture she sent me it just yeah it's very um, personal yeah. very personal and this opportunity to escape from war uh, arises this uh, feeling of guilty that i am in a warm and calm situation and many persons are in war still in war uh, yes, and what, what I would like to add is that as soon as war started, we also started to uh, collect money from our uh, colleagues over the world. Uh, and we received a lot of money from uh, our partners, which we worked with different uh, in the frame of different projects. And now I am responsible to collect this money and I sent uh, transfer this money to the bank uh, account of our dean and there she distribute this money for volunteers and for people who need and, and especially for students who were stuck in a uh, student's um, hostel because they were not able to leave Kharkiv 
for their uh, home city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. So again, if anyone wants, because I really want our participant to hear before we go into academic discussion, I want to hear the um, first hand stories if anyone wants to, to share something. It's again, only if you want to. Okay, May, I'll... Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, I also can share. Uh, I also spent eight days and nights, nights at Kharkiv under bombs attack, and uh, um, I have my own apartment in the city center, but it is located on the 15th floor, and uh, there are 16 floors in the general building, so it means that if there is some attack from the sky, uh, I am in a big risk because of the upper floors. Uh, so that's why I moved to my parents' house, private house in one of the districts of the city. And I spent uh, these eight um, days and nights at my parents' house. But unfortunately, we do not have a um, safety cellar in our private house. So um we haven't any uh, possibility to to hide when when it was bomb attacks and actually um all of this time uh, we just um our heart stopped uh, when we heard these loud voices and attacks uh especially when the Holodnogara district were attacked because our district located next after this one and uh, actually, there was no possibility to be in safe staying in Kharkiv. But um, for a long time, I didn't want to leave my parents because they couldn't live because of our grandma, who is a little bit disabled and needs some care, needs some care. So, uh, but at the eighth uh, morning, when we heard about this occupation of uh, Energodar uh, nuclear uh, station, electro station. Uh, my parents insisted that I need to leave Kharkiv. And uh, um, I made the decision just in several minutes. And um, I wrote to my colleague in uh, Oslo Met University, uh, with uh, whom we have uh, international project to be realized in Ukraine during several uh, years ago. And we have tight connections and communication through uh, during this time. And uh, he um, replied very quickly that um, this institution is ready to host me and uh, they, are, they will be welcome our researchers from Kharkiv. Uh, and uh, actually, I have my own car in Kharkiv, but uh, there was no petrol in the city and in the nearest area, so it was impossible to be evacuated by, by my own transport. So that's why I tried to, to get into the train, and it was really hard because it was a very chaotic situation. And um, when I entered the uh, train, uh, a steward just uh, told me that you need to wait the next one and nobody knows where it can be. And I started to, to cry and to beg because I saw that there was a lot of free space in, inside of the cabin. But, and then she, her heart melted and she let me in. And I also get from Kharkiv to Lviv and we spent 24 hours uh, in the train. Uh, I had the place to sit, um, not to sleep, just to sit. Um, but it was re really nice because previous trains, uh, there was possible only to stand inside of the train, not to, not to sit. And uh, I have also several hours to sleep on the third floor, which uh, typically is for the luggage. And it was a very dirty place, but uh, there was nothing to do. And we also make some rotation of all adults who were in the cabin. So we slept just two, three hours per this night. And eventually I went, I uh, moved to Lviv and uh, as Olga told that her story is about academic networks, I also would like to say that my story about horizontal tides and academic tides because uh, I wrote when I get to the, go to the train, I wrote my friend um, who is also a sociologist uh, and she lives, uh, lives in Lviv. And uh, I also wrote my uh, friend who is a colleague from uh, Warsaw, and she is also a sociologist. 
and uh, they agreed that I can uh, come and um, spend the night uh, in their apartment. So I went to Lviv and when I saw this uh, huge queue of thousands of people who would like to get from Lviv to Przemysl, I decided that I need to choose a little bit another way. And um, actually I use the car to get as much closer to the border as I can, but also I crossed the border on my foot. I crossed 10 kilometers with all of my bag luggage. Uh, but I make it quite quick, uh, comparing with other people who just wait in the train. Uh, uh, is she frozen to me? Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. We hope she will return back, Alexandra. Um, let's wait for her, but maybe, Georgi, I know that you wanted to say something while we're waiting. Yeah, thank you. Um, I myself in Poland I, uh, right now, and I start my contract here in September last year. So uh, I just got the news about war from my wife, uh, who called me at five in the morning on 24th of February in panic and uh, she told me that that they bombing uh, us and uh, she was caught in the she, she, uh, in uh, the outskirts of Kiev uh, it's uh, near Vizgorod and, uh, and then uh, she spent about a week there uh, listening to bombing and uh, looking for the way of uh, of moving from there. The major problem is that uh, this village is next to the uh, one of the main roads and uh, the uh, from Chernihiv to Kiev and uh, the uh, major uh, bridge on this uh, road was destroyed by the Ukrainian army force to block possible offensive from the Chernihiv side. So uh, they had to find the way how to bypass it. And in the week, the, another small bridge was identified. And then uh, she packed and uh, it's, it's a very small car and took <laughs> five dogs and uh, two rats and, uh, and moved to Kiev, Vinitsa, Skvira, and Lviv, and the whole uh, journey took 36 hours uh, uh, by car. And then she spent a, a day in Lviv and then crossed the border in Poland. And today she has arrived, uh, she has arrived uh, here with her dogs. Uh, my two sons are in Kiev now, uh, uh, trying to help uh, with uh, volunteering. Uh, well, that's it. Uh, here, uh, here is a kind of uh, exodus, a kind of well. That just uh, I'm trying to assist people here to um, refugee, um, traveling to some points near to the border and picking them up and bringing them to Lublin. And uh, that what I see, it's just I saw these pictures in uh, either on TV when I watched something from Syria or uh, other uh, hot uh, places. But uh, I also saw these pictures in the movies on the Second World War, uh, Soviet movies, in fact. So, uh, and, and well, paradoxically, ironically, I just reread a uh, Tony Judd's a, a post-war Europe and uh, exactly the uh, chapters devoted to the first post-war years and the times of the when there were there were 15 million refugees in Europe so everything is very close to what happened in to how it looked after and during the last years of war and after the, the, the war so um, a number of Ukrainians here in Lublin and uh, generally in Poland. It's 
I think it's now it's more than one, uh, one million and, and 100,000 people from Ukraine in Poland. And they must admit that Poles uh, well, show themselves to be very effective in, in uh, hosting um, Ukrainians. And uh, well, that's really impressive and moving. Uh, so, uh, well, that's it. Uh, in this Thank situation. you. Thank you, Georgi. Uh, Sasha, if you want to, like, we, we lost you, but if you want to quickly conclude, because I really want to go into this academic discussion on it, but I strongly believe in the power of personal stories for people to understand what's going on there. Uh, yes, just nothing to be at the, I think just, I, I also feel this uh, guilty a little bit because actually I was succeeding in my um, traveling and in my uh, ability to live now here uh, without any bomb attacks on the streets, but a lot of my friends and uh, my close uh, friends, they are still there and they have no possibilities to, to leave Ukraine. So that's why I feel myself uh, guilty and uh, not comfortable now. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's let's move into the first round of questions. And I want to ask you about the first question about the roots of the war. And I'm asking this not to uh, verify the information which already there, but understanding of the roots of the war will help us to deal with negotiation, which already, unfortunately, next round in Turkey already failed. But we have a hope that deep understanding of the roots will help us also to see how we can bring negotiation. So my first question for all participants, if you can give a short answer because we'll have three questions for you, as you know, uh, how you can define the roots of this particular conflict. Just let me know who wants to start. Oh, Maybe. I may I, I may start if uh, just, Please, just yes. because I'm... <laughs> Uh, what we did, I just we will cover just one aspect of this. It's uh, about play, uh, playing with history. And uh, well, once again, paradoxically, just uh, in, in November last year, we have finished a, uh, uh, a kind of overview of Ukrainian-Russian relations during the last 30 years. And one a part of this was a... Uh, use and misuse of history in Ukrainian-Russian relations. And when I observed the, uh, this uh, dealing with history by Putin and his close uh, associates, particularly with Putin, uh, because to understand what happened, we should know how Putin perceives Russia, how he uh, thinks about uh, Ukraine, how he perceives Ukraine, how he thinks about Ukraine. So the major point is, I would be very brief, is that Putin does not recognize Ukraine as a separate entity and uh, as, a, as an actor of history. And he believes that dealing with Ukraine, he deals with some kind of internal issues, internal Russian issues. So uh, the idea of so-called special operation in Ukraine, it is not about having special operation in different entity, in different unit, uh, state unit. It is about dealing with uh, some internal Russian issue. It's not international relations. It's kind of Russian uh, proper uh, where Putin wants to uh, establish certain order. And this is probably the major intrinsic and the basic fundamental problem of perception of Ukraine. And uh, moving from here, Putin does what he does and uh, doing what he's doing. And this is... Uh, and it's still there. He still believes that when he bombs Ukrainian cities, he uh, deals with internal Russian problem. And, uh, and uh, this is the, the major problem is that uh, there are some uh, uh, drug addicts and nationalists and banderivtsi there in Ukraine. And if he, he would wipe them out, then the problem will be, will be solved. So, and uh, an another point here is that by doing this, he invested greatly into, uh, into, <laughs> uh, into recognition of Ukrainians as real separate entity. 
So if before this war there were some groups in Ukraine who were about who, who were who had some kind of illusions about Russia or uh, about Russian intentions, or uh, who thought that uh, well we should maintain a close links, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, now I think that uh, by this moment the, the number number of these people either close to zero or or pretty minimal. Thank you, thank you, Georgi. Who wants to probably okay. probably get okay? Like, I can continue. I can continue uh, mm -hmm. this this issue. Uh, I I think that for Putin, Ukraine is very important point in his ideology. Ideology uh, regarding what does it mean Russia as empire or Soviet Union as empire. I remember a research conducted by Swedish political scientist Bob Peterson in 2000, the second year, I guess. He had interview with Russian politicians and many of them were disappointed that their motherland, Russia, doesn't have their symbolic uh, capital, Kiev, outside of Russia. So for Putin, for his ideology, Kiev is very political, symbolical uh, um, moment. And that is why Kiev has to be part of this symbolic uh, and real uh, Russian empire. So this is a question of geopolitics of Putin. And in connection with this, I also would like to uh, highlight some mistake which our Ukrainian government uh, had during these 30 years. Because any government during this, Ukrainian government during these 30 years did not propose real national project which could unite all Ukrainians. And uh, they did not leave room for flexibility and cultural diversity which Ukraine have. They did not have these ideas, and so they leave ground for Putin to defend, for instance, Russian language in Ukraine or Russian culture in Ukraine. If Ukraine admits that we have Ukrainian Russian language culture, and this uh, uh, Russian language culture is our culture, Ukrainian culture, Putin doesn't have uh, ground to defend it. So I would say the truth of this uh, war is not only is not going on from uh, Russian side, but also from mistake of our uh, government. And now, uh, as uh, Georgi uh, notes about this, really this war created some new ground, some new ideas for you understanding what Ukrainian nation is. It's not about language, it's not about, uh, I don't know, something else. There is some new ground for new solidarity, for new cohesion. And I, I suppose Alexandra will talk more about this issue. Thank you, Olga. Thank you very much. Mikhail, yeah. you wanted. Well, maybe Alexandra will continue since Olga passed for, and then I'll, I'll be ready to intervene. Okay. Um, what's about the roots of the war? Um, according to my point of view, it's actually in the nature of autocracy and tyranny regime. And it's desire to, uh, um, to hold uh, and put uh, vertical pressure and uh, its uh, desire to dominate. And unfortunately, um, we, uh, we cannot say that this war, it, this war happens now, but it also can happen earlier or in future, just because we have such neighbor and just because we have this um, autocracy and tyranny 
near with Ukrainian democracy. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, for me, uh, roots of this war are also connected with the crisis of um, international uh, security in the world. Because actually, as we can see now, uh, aggressor can occupy independent territory and nobody will protect this territory. Uh, if this territory is out of uh, NATO and other institutional um, institutional backgrounds, security backgrounds. So for me, uh, this crisis is the crisis, uh, not, not this crisis, but this war, uh, identified the crisis of uh, um, security issues in the whole world. And nowadays, uh, we should... Um, fasten in the way to revise the statute of the United Nations organization and to provide um, immediate issues to react and to protect Ukraine in this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Mikhail? Well, I agree with uh, Olga and with, uh, with uh, Georgi when they deal and look into ideology. So in a way, it's after the war started, our book that was studying ideological processes, that's inventing majorities, was published just on the 1st of March, so a week after the war started. But in this uh, collection of research, you definitely see how this political imagination was shaping up that created the entire the entire ideological infrastructure for wars in uh, Eastern Europe. First, the war in Georgia, then the war in Donbass, and then war on Ukraine. But if we look from an analytical perspective, it's not only ideology, but some type of rationality. And that's another type of rationality, which is, is, which is connected with geopolitics. Geopolitics is very strange and tricky as a theory. Uh, of international relations. It has more mysticism or more uh, very peculiar posits in it. Uh, however, it was driving the political imagination and plans of power elites in former Soviet Union countries. And this is uh, very important to study both the more or less rationality of this kind and ideology. And here we, we see two dimensions with, where the ideology and uh, rationality come together. The first one is the conflict between Russia and US or the West and other parts of uh, the world which aspire the, to become core countries. So something that was declared like two years ago at the Munich conference on security, the, the Westlessness, that was a hypothesis at that time and uh, diplomats and politicians were discussing it. Today, Putin is sure that West is declining and it, it's the time to attack. And in a way, he also shows himself a leader of autocracies. We live in a world, in a global world, where the third autocratic wave is in place at least for 10 years. And uh, if you look, if not at direct support, but at silence that is coming from China, from uh, India, from Pakistan, Iran, you definitely see that th the re there are countries, there are regimes that expect what will happen with Putin. It's an experiment on, on, in a way, testing the hypothesis of Westlessness. And this antagonism between Russia and the West is critical in like, creating the context for the war on Ukraine. But the second uh, dimension is Russian-Ukrainian conflict. And uh, in this imagination and rationality, geopolitical rationality, Ukraine either could have been either bumper state or the fortress. And the attempt to become fortress and have the NATO shield uh, on Ukraine had a lot of uh, risks. And uh, 
there's, the, these risks were in many ways connected to hesitation of the Western countries whether to support Ukraine and become allies. So far, we have West as a partner. And today, Ukraine is fighting this war with Russia alone. There is a lot of uh, solidarity. There's uh, economic, military support, but we don't have allies in this war. And this is something that is rooted in the situation. So if we look for the resolution for the future uh, resolution uh, of the conflict and the end of the war and uh, uh, move out the, the Russian troops, we should always keep in mind these two dimensions. Thank you very much. And Victoria, do you want to add? Yes, of course. Uh, so first of all, I want to, to take us a, to a little bit broader perspective and say that uh, when we are talking about peacekeeping uh, steps or peacekeeping uh, an analysis, uh, we always, uh, the peacekeepers are describing uh, what is happening. And it, it very much depends uh, on steps which will be connected to the conflict resolutions uh, from uh, on how this peacekeeping community understands the nature of the conflict. So here I want also to draw your attention that this is uh, also peacekeeping rhetoric uh, or view on the conflict that, that is important. So first of all, uh, when uh, the Donbass conflict happened, peacekeeping community had two major explanations. One uh, was a kind of civilizational clash in a, in a wider sense. And the second one, which was quite often used both in uh, different types of uh, think tanks analysis and in media discourse, was uh, the ethno-linguistic clash or regionalism and et ethno-linguistic uh, issues. Uh, I would focus more on the second uh, and comment uh, as a sociologist, uh, just uh, a, less than a year before the, uh, the conflict broke in Donbass, we had a very big team of uh, international team conducting uh, both uh, surveys and in-depth interviews. So for example, uh, just to give you some sense uh, of what was happening on the ground in Donbass, uh, three fourths of our respondents self-identified as Ukrainians and 50% uh, uh, as Ukrainians uh, self-identified in Crimea, but only 3% in both regions uh, admitted that they speak Ukrainian at home. So uh, what we see here, we see that ethnic and linguistic lines, they do not coincide. And this is very important to keep in, in mind. Uh, and if you look at the rhetoric uh, Putin used to explain why, uh, what, what is happening now, his aggression, he used three elements, uh, that militarism of Ukraine, uh, nationalism, and even natism. So let's uh, look, look a little bit what, what is ha what's happening and is happening on the ground. So first of all, I do believe that what really matters and what is the conflict between two societies is a value system. Uh, it's uh, democratic institutions uh, that are not, uh, that Putin doesn't like or way the, the Ukrainian society is uh, behaving politically is very contradicting to what is happening in Russia. So uh, we did have uh, six consecutive elections which were recognized as, as quite transparent by the international community. And if we're talking about regionalism, yes, it was uh, to a certain extent important uh, in, on the political map, but only till 2004 and uh, the last uh, elections uh, we had in both cases, presidents were chosen by the majority. Uh, first, uh, this was over 50% in 2014. And the last president had three, uh, two, uh, 73%. Uh, and if we look at the first step, so, uh, and how the main uh, slogan under which Zelensky came, this is the question when we talk about uh, militarism of Ukraine. He actually, uh, the key, uh, one of the key uh, slogans under which he came was peace. 
And this was the choice of Ukrainian uh, society. They wanted to have a peace and they believed that uh, Zelensky can bring this. And what Zelensky did during the first year with, when he still had some windows of possibilities, he called for the Normandy format. And within the Normandy format, he made a peace building steps which he could. So first of all, uh, he was withdrawing forces from the demarcation line. He was create, uh, creating a demilitarization, a demilitarization zones for what he was criticized within the Ukrainian society. Uh, but it's good, we have an opposition. So we have different views on how conflict might be res uh, resolved. And also uh, he was very much criticized because he took a position of uh, saying that it does not matter what are our historical views or it doesn't matter uh, who you are uh, in his very famous speech to Ukrainian society on the New Year Eve, that it does not ma matter who you are, but we are Ukrainians. And again, he was heavily criticized for that. At the same time, if we look at the situation in the parliament, in spite of the eight years of war, uh, uh, Ukrainian parliament is one of the few in Europe which doesn't have right-wing parties. Uh, and during the elections, they, they were able to get less than 1% of uh, support. And uh, if we are talking about, uh, uh, again, if we look at the sociological polls, we do observe that actually, uh, if we are talking about types of nationalism on, uh, on identities, that were developing after the uh, 2015 in Ukraine, after the beginning of military conflict, we do observe that actually the percent of people supporting such markers as uh, civic and po uh, political understanding of na uh, nation grew uh, much stronger and ethnic elements are constantly being downplayed uh, within the society. So this is not only an uh, official discourse, which was more pro-civil society and pro-political uh, understanding of nation, but also, also the views or moods of the people on the ground very much were for the civic understanding of nation, not ethnic, in spite of the conflict, which actually requires uh, mobilization of different ethno um, ethnic ethnically based uh, stereotypes and, and so on. Uh, I will talk maybe later when, if we will discuss IDP situation about the civil society, enormous wave uh, which, was, which grew in, in, in Ukrainian society after the beginning of the conflict and when we had two, over two million of uh, internally displaced population, uh, and society stepped in and was helping them. So this also tells a lot about the relationship uh, of, of on the ground between people from different regions and from different cultural, or religious or ethnic backgrounds. And uh, just to, to summarize and to come up, uh, with what I've started with discourses and understandings, I think what is first of all behind of Putin's rhetoric, this for me is more a kind of a 19th century understanding that uh, someone can come, uh, this is very imperialistic point of view, that someone can come and actually reshape identities of uh, the, the people on the ground from above and very little understanding that uh, Ukraine is a, quite a democratic and political nation. And uh, if, for example, Zelensky decides to do something, uh, if people do not like this, they would protest. So uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, it's very much, it's, it's important that uh, ruling elite has to look for the second consensus with, with uh, citizens, not like in Russia when elite might decide to, to, to start invasion to the neighboring country 
and then try to suppress protests from, from below. Thank you very much, Victoria. So I really want to stress that uh, in comparison with many publications which now happened in the United States and newspapers and others, this panel really show very, I would say, nested or multi-layered uh, re reasons or roots of this particular, together with geopolitics, together with this marginalized position of Ukraine between two powers who will use it as a playground for its territory without recognizing and giving dignity to Ukraine together with manipulations of identity, uh, as uh, Georgi uh, stressed very well, manipulation with the history. We also see local dynamics within Ukraine itself and within Russia itself has also contributed to, to this particular topic. And uh, I always was stressing in my writing how important is developed instead of uh, nationalistic rhetoric of Russia develop liberal civic meaning of national identity in Ukraine, but unfortunately there were some elements, of course, which Putin were using for uh, uh, his purposes there. It was a push against language, a push against culture. So we, we, we all have to recognize all these multiple layers to be able to actually come for really comprehensive negotiation agreement. So my second, I will, for sake of the time, I see, we probably had to plan it for five hours. So um, for sake of the time, I will unite to my questions because it makes also sense. Uh, so the question for panelists, what are short term and long term consequences of this war for Ukraine and what can be done? What do you see as the first steps and long term steps to address this main issue? Who would like to start? If I can. Yes, please, Mikhail. So basically what we saw at the beginning of the war was aiming at the fast regime change. There were multiple miscalculations uh, on the side of Putin and his entourage. This uh, entire military operation was uh, the well, military adventure and badly prepared, you, you can definitely see a, a lot of flaws. So from uh, this regime change operation, it became a patriotic war for Ukraine. And it's a fact. It's already changed the nature of the military, uh, of the military operation. So it's becoming some social event, historical event which totally changes the scope. And Russia seems to not to be ready for this. Uh, and now it turns nasty uh, into the ground war with elements of total war when uh, the civilians are being killed, bombed and mass numerously every day with a growing, uh, with a growing um, inhuman strength. And there's also a a surge of resistance. There was a huge trust in president. So uh, nation gathers around the, uh, the president, around the flag. There's also huge movement of, of different strata and genders in Ukraine. Everyone creates these uh, horizontal networks in support for the army, uh, battalions of other origin and uh, this fight is being structured. So right now, 15 days after the beginning of the war, uh, the fronts, this organized uh, ground war is being structured. You see how Ukrainian army tries to counter strike, how the uh, determination of Putin fills, fuels in the new uh, resources into the uh, military campaign. And now we, we also see that the, the nature or the political geography has changed of, of Europe, uh, political geography of Europe. And this change has recreated, there's a iron curtain that goes through uh, Eastern Europe, and there's a war that is in Eastern Europe, and there's a central Western Europe, and there's UK, which is a different entity, which is probably not European anymore. And in this constellation, we, we, have, we see that there is a change of Europe as a common 
uh, space, political values, uh, cultural space, and so on and so on. So this new geography is also felt this morning uh, when the Versailles conference started, the summit in Versailles, there were several uh, European leaders who were pronouncing the same thing. Uh, EU is not the same anymore. There's also change of the Council of Europe. So we, Russia starts the, the process of leaving Council of Europe. And it's only the question who will be the first in this competition. Either Kremlin will do everything that the, the Duma have to ratify denial of certain uh, treaties or the Council of Ministers will uh, refuse in membership to the Russia, to the Russian Federation. Anyhow, the, this total uh, change of the world that we live in creates new perspectives. And the war in Ukraine will have very long lasting uh, results. If uh, Ukrainian uh, leadership will find it possible to stop the war right now, and as President Zelensky and uh, Chief of Staff Yermak have said today, there would be, they, they already talk about the model of some sort of neutrality based on real guarantees. Is it possible? I'm not sure, but still, if this model is in place, then we are talking about Ukraine returning to the buffer zone a model that did not provide Ukraine with any development. Uh, so if the war continues, we will see more and more hostilities, more and more blood and destruction of the peaceful, of our peaceful country. And this blood will definitely create cleavages in Eastern Europe for generations ahead. So what I, I see, it's whatever, Resolution is, it's not very bright, in my opinion. Thank you, Mikhail. Who would like to? Maybe I will focus on another issue as a sociologist. I, I, and I personally, in my research, uh, was focusing on both in internally displaced people and refugees uh, from Ukraine beginning from 2014. I, and I guess this issue is now also extremely pressing one. So uh, just to compare, because it's very important to see what are the changes or what is a specific. Uh, first of all, when this refugee or IDP flow happened in 2015, they were pretty much invisible for the international community, just uh, first of all, because, uh, because of the civil society support. So uh, there were no case show uh, refugee camps on the territory of Ukraine. So uh, quite uh, soon, uh, the discussion was focusing more on the, on the conflict itself and much less attention was paid to the uh, internally displaced population and their issues. But what we can already see if we compare the politics towards people who were moving uh, outside of uh, Ukraine, refugees, uh, we do observe already at those early stages uh, attempts of Russia to use them as a weapon. So we can talk about the weaponization of ref refugees. And this was the first step. And then the second step was uh, the situation in Belarus, Belarus uh, just a few months ago. And then on, at the very beginning, bef before the conflict, again, this refugee uh, um, <clears throat> card was played. So Russia was trying to create this refugee camps and showcase and, and all this rhetoric about the uh, um, mass killings of, of uh, Ukrainians on the territories of London Bus were used as a reason to start this campaign. So I guess if we are talking uh, for the future, a lot of international attention has to be paid how to prevent uh, growing and escalating uh, weapon, weaponization of refugees to deal or to create conflicts or to deal conflicts or to push to certain uh, decisions and so on. 
Uh, what is different, I guess, uh, but very different is, is that, first of all, for Ukrainians, the Western border was closed in 2015 because uh, we didn't have a free regime at that moment. So very few were able to escape to, to Europe. And those uh, who were escaped, uh, they, the only possibility was to apply for the refugee uh, status, but uh, only 2% of this very small percent of people who actually dared to apply uh, was giving this status. So this was a very bitter experience for Ukrainians uh, in between 2015 and recent situation. Uh, but after 2017, when, when uh, borders were opened, uh, a big flow of labor migration happened. And actually, this Ukrainian uh, labor migration in, in Europe created preconditions for uh, crisis resolution we have today, because we have much more Ukrainians staying in Europe, have uh, some legal e possibilities to stay. And in this way, they also can accept relatives or friends who are uh, coming to, to European Union, for example, as a refugees. Uh, and at the same time, uh, because of the Syrian crisis, European Union also learned uh, that uh, granting the refugee status is not a, always a good and flexible solution. Why? Because it creates a lot of limitations. People cannot move, people cannot work, and actually uh, put a lot of pressure on the social uh, systems of those countries. But if we have people with a high level of human capital, I guess it's very important uh, for them, and this is exactly what is happening right now with Ukrainian refugees uh, in the European Union, that they are granted very special status, which allows them to have jobs. So it will help receiving communities to take pressure, at least partially from the social systems, uh, because what is happening is the biggest refugee crisis in Europe since Second World War. Within two weeks, we have two million people who escaped. And, and if this humanitarian corridors will be opened, uh, we expect another four to seven millions to come. So uh, I think uh, what is important now to think how European community will sustain this amount of people uh, for a long run perspective, because if this conflict will be a protracted conflict, uh, those efforts we right now see with civil society won't be enough, because we can give our flats or, I don't know, our friends in Poland everywhere can share their hotels, their businesses, but they cannot stop them for years. They can stop them for few weeks or four months. And then there, are, there would be a lot of questions how to deal with, with this refugee situation. Thank you very much for stressing. This is a very important sustainability. It's now everything, everybody has this support and so on, but we know that it will come to sustainability and it will be a very big issue, You're completely right. Um, okay, who is on next? Maybe. Okay. Olga, Olga, okay. Very shortly, three points. Firstly, uh, European community should develop language of description this war. Uh, because uh, since 2014, we remember that uh, there was not real adequate language of description. And we had IDP. Why we had IDP? Because if they uh, recognize refugee, it means Europe, uh, Europe has to reflect refugee and has special program for refugee. So uh, now uh, from this European, from international community, and first of all, from European community, from this politician uh, from EU, we need uh, adequate language of description of this situation with war. It, this is the first, because language of description has particular concept 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 oh my god <laughs> help me <laughs> yes yes uh, regarding 
uh, future program, programs of supporting of Ukraine and people who uh, come to uh, European countries. Uh, Victoria mentioned about uh, time uh, of supporting in, uh, of this refugee, but I would like to bring another very important point. Uh, at least it is really very visible here in Finland, and we very briefly uh, uh, were able to, uh, to discuss with my uh, Finnish uh, colleague here. Everywhere in European countries, there are a lot of Russians who support politics of Putin. And Ukrainians who come now, who escape from war and, and who come to uh, Europe, uh, it is really very possible that this conflict will be transformed to this European country. I'm not talking about hot conflict, about war, but it will be not a uh, secured situation for those countries because uh, European countries has to solve this potentially uh, possible conflict between Ukrainian ref refugee and Russian uh, migrants there. And here I can give you an uh, example. For instance, it's this uh, not so big uh, city, Yuen, so there are Finnish Russian school uh, for years, and they have uh, uh, several uh, subjects they study in, fin in Finnish language and several subjects in Russian and uh, all these uh, Russian subjects by uh, Russian educational program. And uh, there are many mixing, uh, ethnically mixing family. So uh, it is really very, very uh, possible that this conflict between Ukrainian um, refugee and Russian migrants uh, could appear in European country and European countries, European government, uh, they have to have some uh, solution how to deal with this situation. And first of all, the role of media should be very important, very important. And third point, uh, it's regarding Ukraine itself, Ukrainian society. I would say that maybe it is paradoxically but uh, I would say that I am happy now that the issue who is the real Ukrainian does not exist anymore. We remember that, especially first decades in Ukraine, there was some ideas about who is real Ukrainian and Eastern Ukraine uh, uh, were not seen by some uh, groups uh, of Ukrainian society as a real Ukrainian, справжні українці. But now this situation with war showed that all Ukrainians are real Ukrainians, справжні українці. And for me, it is very positive for Ukrainian society. So we don't have something to uh, something to decide who we are. Uh, war show who we are, and this is clear. Thank you very much, Olga. And uh, okay, um, Alexandra or uh, Jorge. Can I continue? Yeah, please. Sure. Uh, as Olga previously mentioned, that during thirty years. We didn't have any uh, national building state plan, but I guess that during this two, two weeks of war, we have covered this gap. And uh, here I totally agree with Olga, because uh, as we all can see how threatens social cohesion in contemporary Ukraine. Uh, first of all, we see uh, this almost absolute support of um, uh, President Zelensky and uh, our army and other political institutions and this uh, enormous support for Ukrainian society, first of all. The second one, we see the, uh, the power, the force of horizontal tides, bonds, um, especially in the sphere of volunteering and donation, because it's also is viewed in the social cohesion studies as a key 
key element of social cohesion on the national level. And the third aspect of social cohesion is identity. And here, it's all also um, unexpected previously the highest level, the highest level and nothing should be discussed or proven. And here I support Olga's idea. The second, um, I would like to mention that in Ukraine and among European Union, we can see the transformation of regime of market and regime of exchange uh, on regime of gift. And this is about how um, social relationship nowadays occur in Ukraine and within European Union. So people build their relationship with the refugees, with each other. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, on the uh, regime of gift, demonstrating strong altruism uh, among European Union and Ukrainian society. And the third point is uh, total rebranding of Ukra Ukrainian passport abroad, because previously we um, uh, we heard that Ukraine was uh, like a third way countries, and nowadays uh, uh, Ukrainian passport is a total symbol of freedom, uh, and courage, and uh, uh, some pattern should be followed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgi. Thank you. Uh, well, short-term and long-term outcomes and consequences. Uh, first of all, uh, we have few information about uh, what's going on uh, because, uh, of course, from Ukrainian side, we have a information which is filtered by uh, by the by certain task and a certain desire to show picture certain picture uh, if uh, you observe information from Russian side how they present it it's different definitely <laughs> a very different picture so uh, of course for analysis we should have a kind of balance uh, balanced information so we can compare Ukrainian and Russian information so um, uh, for for short term consequence uh, outcomes, what I see now that there is the there is no dynamic in 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 the offensive uh, in, in the north, and uh, still there are some dynamics in the south, and uh, I have a sense that uh, probably. Uh, the offensive to Kiev, uh, they decided to either to stop or to frozen there and to uh, develop their uh, offensive in the south to ensure the corridor uh, from uh, the southern part of Donbass to Crimea. And then what uh, what is really alarming is that they started to build a fortification uh, constructions uh, over there, which means that they are preparing for frozen conflict which means that they're preparing for turning the south of Ukraine into a new Donbas, uh, occupied part of the south. And uh, then uh, will, they will then base their uh, demands and claims on the fact of having this corridor. Another very alarming thing is that they establish control over two nuclear plants. And uh, this is a... Uh, this is a part uh, might be part of uh, of blackmailing, not just Ukraine, but also the uh, Western community. And uh, so, um, pro once again, um, Russians believed that they would uh, finish this operation in three fifteen days, and they failed. At the same time, as I see uh, and from Ukrainian side, people expect, some people expect that it also will be over soon. And, uh, and these expectations also might not be fulfilled. So uh, in short term perspective, Ukraine has to be prepared for much longer uh, fight than expected and with two prolonged fights uh, at local levels. Uh, 
Uh, Russians now changed tactics. Uh, they they stopped to move by big columns of uh, of vehicles, and they uh, started to uh, atomize their uh, forces on smaller groups, which uh, provides them which much which with much more flexibility and less losses. Uh, and uh, there is still no change in tactics from Ukrainian side. So I don't know how uh, what would happen next few days. Uh, probably they will use uh, these tactics to penetrate the outskirts of big cities and to start street fightings on the uh, on near Kiev, and uh, they will uh, go on with shelling the uh, the certain uh, objects. So, uh, in the long-term perspective, uh, as I see, Zelensky started to speak about the pro uh, prospects of recovery of Ukraine after the war. Uh, well, I, I don't know how it work, how it would work. First, uh, the, first the uh, well, the first task is somehow to stop the. Uh, the offensive it stopped at certain uh, at certain directions but uh, it it is still there is still offensive in the south and in the east um, well uh, it's it's a lot of enthusiasm now in ukraine in uh, in in defense it's really unprecedented uh, unity of different forces uh, uh, even among former political enemies there is a lot of enthusiasm in the West now, but if uh, this war uh, will uh, get into prolonged phase in, in, in months or probably years, so then we might expect the same fatigue of war uh, in the West, like it happened in Donbass. So uh, we should be prepared to this. I'm talking about this not to frighten people, uh, but just to be realistic and to be prepared and to look for uh, options and to look for uh, strategies, how to, uh, to be prepared for this and to build strategies uh, based on these expectations and prognosis. So um, at this moment, it's, it's really the moment of uncertainty after initial success. The initial success for Ukraine was that uh, the uh, the Putin's plans failed altogether? The initial success as the Russian army, uh, which was presented by Putin and by Russian propaganda as a uh, as the most powerful army in the world, well, people just learned that this army is not the most powerful in the world. Uh, however, I have a sense that Putin is ready to uh, to exhaust his resources, including human resources, and to send more people to die in Ukraine, which means, means that uh, more Ukrainians would die defending Ukraine. And then there will be a uh, uh, struggle of resources, who has more resources and Ukraine has less resources. But if the West will uh, will support Ukraine uh, at the, at this level, like like it, they do this now, so Ukraine has great chances to defend itself and uh, to uh, to defeat Russia, at least at, on its own territory. At this moment, the talks with Lavrov and Kuleba of Lavrov and Kuleba in Turkey, well didn't bring any kind of result. So Putin still advance a uh, ultimatum. So, so he wants Ukraine to accept all his terms and all his demands. Probably, uh, well, there are some change in rhetorics of, uh, of second uh, line people among Putin uh, entourage, uh, like Zakharov, etc. But uh, it's still the the major line is still to press uh, Ukraine until Ukraine will capitulate, and the good news is that Ukraine uh, has no <laughs> intention to capitulate and to uh, and to 
to be defeated. So very uncertain, several scenarios, several options. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, we uh, cannot talk about, uh, let's say, uh, extreme optimism. Uh, of course, we have. To, we will say, and we will say that we will win, and we will win. But uh, we should be ready for a long and exhausting uh, struggle with aggressor. Thank you very much. What um, I hear from participants, I completely agree with with my own position and experience that we really need continuous support of international organizations and Olga put it very strongly, very well that how, how much we need, how much Ukraine had to show international community with Orange Revolution, with Maidan, with others, that there is a dignity, that there is a willingness to be European country. Now with the war, it, unfortunately, but there is a really shown that Ukrainian people really strive for democracy, strive for liberal uh, understanding. And I hope that Versal, as Mikhail told, really, because there are a lot of resistance of all the European Union members to really have this process as a quick process. They want to look into a lot of issues, corruption again coming up instead of helping and what happens in this wild east of democracy where ukraine is it now really left ukraine with playground for nato for russia with a lot of uh, ascriptions of identities and histories instead of accepting this as a very strong unit of brave people who strive for democratic values and democratic so as soon as West really will acknowledge, accept it and help European Union entry for Ukraine. But at the same time, all of you really express very cautious uh, ideas about development of the war. So probably negotiation, peace negotiation, ceasefire. And this is what I see in many questions which come up here. Do we need neutrality of Ukraine between my NATO and Russia? Would it help? What could be other options for negotiations that I, I'm just putting together with a few minutes? If you can give maybe one minute to respond, what do you see? What are some recommendations for negotiation to go forward? Maybe one minute each, each participant. Or somebody wants to move. Irina, I, I just um, missed your question. Uh, could you please repeat it? Uh, yeah, so my question, is, it's probably I put too many questions in the, for five minutes, but my question is, what can be the strong, why negotiations failed and what can be possibilities for negotiation, what can be there, and also how European Union and international community should, what, what they should be doing to help, to secure, help, help Ukrainian as an independent European liberal nation. Well, I just, uh, well, you see that uh, there is a intensive uh, search for intermediaries in the uh, in the last week uh, different countries proposed the uh, to be intermediaries uh, in in the negotiations uh, and so this attempt uh, did not result in any uh, in any uh, well, kind of solution uh, well now turkey is a intermediary so um, i think that uh, at this stage uh, no uh, side is ready to, uh, for, uh, ready for any kind of consent and any kind of uh, uh, retreat. So um, uh, the only option now is to uh, raise pressure on Russia, uh, to introduce new sanctions, more, more, uh, uh, more specific and more harsh sanctions. And as we see, as we learn, some <laughs> countries do not follow this uh, sanctions politics and uh, still uh, buy, uh, still buy uh, oil and gas in Russia and still financing the terrorism because Russia is recognized now as a country ter terrorist country. So 
uh, more sanctions and more pressure. The only option just to destroy. The only problem is that uh, these sanctions would not uh, have immediate impact. So from one side, these sanctions should be introduced. From the other side, Ukraine has to uh, receive more and more and more aid and help, uh, including humanitarian aid and humanitarian help. Uh, and help, military help, I mean uh, more uh, more vehicles, more more guns, etc., etc. So uh, this is the only option to uh, somehow to oppose them. I see that there are some questions about the neutrality and neutral status of Ukraine, and Zelensky told that we might be ready. But I don't trust, uh, I think that Russia is absolutely not trustful. I don't know what kind of guarantees should be uh, should be provided by those who would uh, secure the neutrality status of Ukraine, but uh, now it is absolutely in, unimaginable. I cannot imagine how Ukraine might become a neutral country and demilitarized country. The only <laughs> the only option now for Ukraine to be safe and to uh, defend itself is to have a strong army and strong and uh, contemporary army, which, was, uh, which is armed with the contemporary weaponry, uh, which, by the way, shows now that uh, Ukrainians are ready and uh, able to use this contemporary weaponry to uh, oppose aggression. So uh, um, I don't see at this moment uh, for, for a short, short run prospect, I don't see uh, any points of agreement between this uh, between fighting sides, and fighting sides also not not ready. And if you look at the even at the independent polls in Russia, you will see that majority of Ukrainian citizens support Putin in this. And uh, if you observe Russian TV channels, which are the major sources of information for majority of Russians, you will see that how they show this in Russia, so they they just unaware of what's going on here in Ukraine. So, that's it. Thank well, you. Thank you. We actually, just a second, we, we actually finished the time, but I really would like to stay a little bit longer for those who want to, I really want to give every participant the opportunity to answer. Mikhail? I'll give just a very short answer. I think at this time, none of the sides of the conflict of the war uh, are able to reach any conflict resolution uh, decisions. Right now, there's only one uh, possibility is to call for armistice, stop the active uh, campaign and let the uh, civilians flee and to force all, all the all the sides also to, to stop shelling on the civilians. And then there would be next steps. But right now, this first, uh, the first decision should be to stop the ground war and killing. Thank you very much. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I think there are three levers for the security uh, building. First of all, uh, no steps that would again use this uh, formula of two competing worlds or West versus Putin, NATO versus Putin. And then what happens? Ukraine is sidelined. So, so uh, no decisions uh, through negotiations in between leaving Ukraine aside. This is on the highest level. It's also important to understand what I said that Ukrainian government cannot press any decisions which are not supported by the society. So it's also very important to look at the moods and attitudes of the Ukrainian society, not to press what society is absolutely not in support for because it won't be possible and it won't be stable. And the third level, which is more for those who are uh, right now abroad, and if, if we are talking about different peace uh, keeping approaches, one of the most important right now is building peace from below, from everyday situations. But here I also have to say that peacekeepers should rethink their toolboxes they are using, uh, because what at least I observe uh, in Germany, 
that first of all those kids who are fleeing they immediately are uh, confronted in a positive way with local Russian kids uh, as attempts to to build and peacekeeping practices within I don't know classrooms or families or friendships and and go on but this might really sparkle a, a very big uh, internal conflicts in diasporas what Olha was already saying so it's very important to give those uh, people who are coming uh, some different tools or at least some time to overcome the shock and stress and then only gradually a step into the other level. So I think that peacekeeping community has to pay a lot of attention to these mm -hmm. issues. Thank you, Victoria. You're just really important. I always just for now three major issues we need to do with from peacekeeping, peace building, and uh, peace building. Sorry, we speak trauma healing. We have to speak about reconciliation, which start in the very midst of conflict. Very, and also we speak about peace education for children. Thank you. You stress this three very important points. Thank you. Um, Olga, Alexandra. Okay, very shortly. Maybe uh, this, my notes, my ideas is unrealistic. Maybe I am naive, but uh, I don't know how to do this, but something should happen inside of Russia, within Russia. And uh, I am not sure about effectiveness of sanction. For instance, some example, well-known IT company Cisco, international company, American company, US company, they just uh, left uh, all Russian employees. IT specialist. And there are some other company, uh, companies uh, which operate in Russia and other countries, they just uh, decided not to uh, involve Russians in their company. What does it mean? Will this uh, give some positiveness uh, in this struggle between Russia and uh, Ukraine. No, it just only creates uh, some uh, more negative attitudes of these maybe neutral persons in Russia toward Ukraine. So sanctions should be more targeting. targeting. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one point. And of course, what is unrealistic now but very important regime in russia should be changed but who will do this this is a big question thank you alexandra yeah um, i guess that contemporary agenda of negotiation process sounds not realistic and this is capitulation of ukraine and actually a neutrality status of ukraine should be out of the question because it's not only like a risky or tricky thing it's actually uh, it's actually a, a provoking thing because um, uh, there is no guarantees that um, uh, it uh, in the future, yes, there, will be, there wouldn't be any next step of war. And in this case, Ukraine will lose everything because, because of this neutral st uh, status. So uh, I think that negotiation process should be revised and uh, the agenda of negotiation process should be changed. Uh, I don't know what it can be exactly, um, sanctions or, or some other things, but nowadays we need to go out from this discourse that uh, Russian side uh, try, to, um, try to provide and try to establish. We need to form our own discourse our own vision of uh, negoci negotiation process, and we should form the agenda of negotiation process. I guess this is a mistake of 
the, of current negotiation process because all of these positions they are, are proclaimed by Russian side. And uh, um, continuing Olga's point of view about um, revolution in, in uh, Russia, I believe in future revolution in Russia. And I remember how uh, how the Yanukovych regimes uh, were changed and there uh, that was the police and military services who um, go on the side of the students. And I, I really hope that um, we can influence and we can target this uh, professional group because uh, it controls it, con it control how um, how civil society can realize their positions, and I guess maybe we should uh, put more pressure and more informal uh, informational force to work with the um, military and police institutions in Russia now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for stressing this very important point uh, that uh, how we how we negotiation are now the daily negotiation from position. And this is what we teach our students in our institute, which is completely wrong. Right. And we know that a lot of things are constructed and especially as all participants stress and Georgi was speaking about it very strongly, the whole media war in uh, 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 Russia and all these media campaigns in Russia. So it's how actually Putin will construct the victory because he can construct in different way and present it to him. So maybe negotiations should help him to construct the idea of the victory and exit the war. And this is a very, very good point together with points about how sanctions should be towards the regime, but not the people. Mikhail. Well, right now, Russia is a pariah state, and the sanctions that were introduced, uh, they, they are created to uh, make Russia pay for this war in the first place, and in the second, to limit Russia's ability to keep this level of aggression or increasing the level of aggression uh, for in the long run. However, it's not clear uh, how soon the impact, the economic impact, the social impact that the sanctions have will result. In my opinion, and I might be too optimistic, but in my opinion, right now, these sanctions and the start of the war, the launch of the war by Putin, have ruined two social contracts that existed in contemporary Russia. The first contract with elites, elites were not involved, their interests are uh, ruined, by the war and by the sanctions. And this contract between Putin and power elites is ruined. So it's just a matter of time when the coup will take the place. And the second contract is the, the social contract with the wider populations. So uh, the populations were granted with income in return for political, well, income and safety in return for political freedoms. Right now, there's no freedom, no income, no security. Uh, so that's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for way overstay, but I think it's very important. I really want to express my deepest, deepest gratitude for all my colleagues who, who in the middle of their move, movement or in the middle of all other uh, very, very, uh, hard situations who can come today and speak to us. I I think this exactly this fatigue of the war, I start actually seeing it today. Today there was less publication about the war on me. I wake up first, first what I do, I look at my uh, news feed and I see already decline. So the re reason for such sessions, the reasons because we involve so many students and some of these participants who we had today more, more than 150 participants and some of them are complete classes so it's like 30 uh, 20 students or more who were there as a one participant so i would like to thank you and i hope we will continue this i will contact you maybe in months or something and continue to have in these events and also see all other options how we can spread the world thank you for for being such a wonderful colleague for so long time olga 
Karina, uh, and uh, I, I guess Alexandra uh, support me <laughs> in these ideas. <clears throat> Uh, I would like to say thank you, especially you that you organize this panel because, uh, you know, on the eve of this panel, we were talking with Alexandra and we were talking what, what, we, what we can say because we were two weeks in this situation and uh, this panel allowed us to uh, stay beyond, go beyond of this shock, of this striving to survive and to reflect a little bit. So it's our first step for reflection and thank you very much for this. Thank you, thank you. And we are working with multiple colleagues. We will work with Mikhail to do more at Canon, more at my school and George Mason here today. I don't know if he's still here, my colleague from UK, who is the, we're meeting tomorrow to organize, plan organizing a, a panel in UK for this. So. We will try to really spread word as much as we can and not to allow fatigue to sustain as uh, Victoria told, sustain support for Ukraine. So everyone is uh, here on this panel again. I really appreciate you being wonderful colleagues for years and years. And my great wishes for everyone, my big hug for you and your family. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.